So we're very happy uh, for this last summer meeting um, of the Western Hemisphere Virtual Symplectic Seminar to have Dusa McDuff, Nikki McGill, and Morgan Weiler. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about this project that I've been working on for quite a while, which is about embedding ellipsoids in the one point blow up of CP2. And I'm talking about the third stage. Of, I've actually been working on this for several years, beginning with this big project with the WISCON group, um, with Mar Maria Bitozzi, Tara Holm, Amelie Moore, Grace Mwakombwa, Anna Rita Pires, and Morgan Weiler. So we worked on it for a while, and then Nikki and I sort of took some of it and we worked on some aspect of it, the symmetries aspect. And now I'm working with Morgan, who is our champion staircase finder, uh, finder about um, recursive staircase patterns. And I want to, con because it's a huge thing, I just want to concentrate on that part today. But first of all, of course, I have to give you some introduction about what we're doing. So I'm going to give an introduction and um, give you some technical background and you know, state the main results. And then um, um, Morgan is going to describe the staircases in more detail and then Nikki will explain some aspects of a proof. Um, now, so the basic question we're looking at is the question of when an ellipsoid, a varying ellipsoid, EAB, so it's a four dimensional ellipsoid, sort of looks like this with two, important measurements, we've got an area A and an area B, which are the areas of the cross sections. And so this is, this is A and B. And um, the question of when that embeds symplectically in some, fix, uh, some given target manifold, X omega. And you, this is actually a surprisingly interesting question when you vary the ellipsoid. In the ellipsoid, we sort of normalize. So we take the first let A to be one, so E one Z. So Z is sort of like the aspect ratio of the ellipsoid. So we fix our domain and then we sort of enlarge the target and look at the minimum enlargement that we need in order to fit in this ellipsoid and call that the value of this function, this capacity function at Z. So then Z varies, that's, so that's the eccentricity varies and you want to know, can you fit it in completely and fill all the volume or other obstructions, which mean you need to have a bigger target and so on. And um, the, you know, this, this expansion constant is always bigger than the volume constraint. And for nice X, you can show that it equals the volume when, X, when Z is sufficiently large. So that means if you have a long skinny ellipsoid, you can always completely fill, there are no obstructions. But if the ellipsoid is more fat, then there definitely are obstructions. Now um, we have, a, a, in four dimensions we have, and for convex toric domains, we do have a complete description of what this function is. You know, we can describe it. But the formula is what I would think of as opaque. I mean, it is a formula, but it's very hard to say what the function is when you get it. In any way, it, it's determined by obstructions coming either from embedded contact homology, that's one way of seeing the obstructions, or by obstructions coming from exceptional divisors and blow-ups of CP2, which is my preferred way of doing it, but you get the same answer. And in any case, the obstruction comes from curves, j holomorphic curves in the target manifold. Do you say you have a question in the chat from uh, Nate Botman? What does nice mean? I don't want to say, I don't know exactly what it means, but a convex toric domain, um, something, you know, I think for any, probably for any compact four manifold. Um, and anyway, what we get is that this function is the maximum of the volume constraint together with some piecewise linear function, which is determined by the, all the other ECH capacities. Um, so here, so why this problem is interesting is I think because the answer is interesting. So this is the first time case it was worked out where the target is a ball. And I worked this out with Felix um, some time ago. And the point is here, that the function, instead of just being a general increasing function, has this very sharp step structure. So the orange, the orange curve here, that's the volume constraint, this one here. And um, then the, the function itself goes up in these steps. It goes up like that, 
then it goes up like that, and then it goes up like that. And there's infinitely many steps until you get to this accumulation point where tor is the, um, tor is the golden ratio. And the, the, here the, the volume constraint is just a square root function. So, you know, the square root function, if, if the z is tor to the fourth, then the, the volume constraint is tor squared. And so that's the, the staircase. And then there's a um, transitional region until you get it sufficiently big, which in this case is 17 over six squared, and then and it's just the volume, all the constraints disappear. And so this was a really surprising answer, and especially the fact that it was such a number theoretic answer, because the steps are completely determined by the Fibonacci numbers. So, you know, it's, it's, there's a real interesting connection with number theory here. Elementary number theory, I mean, just sort of Fibonacci numbers. Um, now, you know, there's a rather few plausible results or plausible guesses as to general behavior of this function in when, when the target is higher dimensional. Of course, you can define it in any dimension, but we do, we do have results and we also have results for different targets in dimension four, but I'm not gonna say much about that because I want to concentrate on our project. But just for some language, we say that the target manifold has a staircase if this function has infinitely many non-smooth points. So in other words, there are infinitely many corners or steps like these points here. Those are the steps. And if there are infinitely many of those, then you say it's got a staircase. And typically you see these step constraints, you know, this, this vertical, you know, increasing line is a line through the origin and this line is a horizontal line. So they, they typically look like that. Um, okay. So now one relevant bit of work was, was Usher's work who studied um, staircases or what tried to find staircases when the target was uh, an irrational polydisc. So it's a product of, of, of disks of different, of you know, one you fix at one and the other one you vary B. So you have this one parameter family of target spaces and you try and find out what are the difference between, you know, does, does B make any difference? Do you always get the same behavior? What do you get? And he found a doubly infinite family of staircases, each at a different irrational value of B. There are some rational Bs where it's known to have a staircase, I think three of them, but you know, there are infinitely many irrational B where there's a staircase. Now, starting a few years ago, we looked at the problem and we were looking at this family of Hirzebruck surfaces, which is a one point blow up of CP2. So you take CP2, whose toric image looks like a, a triangle, and then to blow it up, you know, blowing up just consists of cutting off a corner and get removing that because each, each little triangle corresponds to a ball. So HB looks like this, where you, you, you chop that off. So perhaps I should make it look like this. This is its toric model. This has got size B, this has got one minus B, one minus B, and that's one. So that's the, so the effort, you know, the area, the volume of this thing is one minus B squared. That's the normalized volume. And the length of the sides, affine length of the boundary is equal to three minus B. Um, and, we were so we were looking at this particular family, and our work was was really we started from this this very nice paper by Christopher Gardner, Holm, Mandini, and Pires concerning staircases and rational toric manifolds, and so they found for this family. Of course, when B is zero, you just have the ball, so there's a Fibonacci stairs. But when B is one third, it's uh, it's a Fano monotone manifold, and they found a staircase there. And they conjectured that that's the, those are the only rational values where there's a staircase. And they also proved a, a key result, which is that um, if, well, it was more general than this, but for our particular case, if we were looking at the one point blow up of, of CP2, and it has a staircase, then, the staircases, the steps of the staircase must accumulate at a particular point called the accumulation value of B. And that's the unique solution bigger than one of this quadratic equation. So that looks very mysterious, but in fact, it's the techniques of proof are, are not that difficult. Um, and then 
the other thing is at, if you have a staircase at that accumulation point, then it's unobstructed. So it means that the capacity function actually equals the volume function. So there's no obstruction there, but you have this family of, of constraints which take you to that point. And um, in the toric model, these, this coefficient three minus b squared over one minus b squared, it looks terrible, but three minus b, it's the affine length of the boundary and one minus b squared is twice the area. So this has a geometric meaning. And for the other toric um, cases they looked at, you get a similar formula with appropriate coefficients put in there. So then the thing is, you're ve we're very interested in this function. What is this fun accumulation function? So given a b, what is this cb? And so what we've drawn here is the what's what we call the accumulation curve, which is a parameterized curve where B varies. And the first, the first coordinate of it is the accumulation, the Z value. So that's the accumulation. And the second coordinate, the, the height is the volume. And so if you look at it, you know, you start here, which is where B is zero. And at this point, that's this is the point tor to the fourth tor squared, which corresponds to the Fibonacci staircase. And then you, you know, B increases and you go along. This is the point B equals a, a fifth, which is where the volume is a minimum. This point is where B is a third, and that's where you have the other staircase. So this is a special value. It's a minimum of the accumulation function, and you have a staircase. And then it sort of goes on up like that. So you notice that, um, it's a, that this function is two to one in general. And it, you know, it has very interesting properties. Really, the, it, the properties of this function govern, our, um, govern what's going on. Um, and we're going to mostly restrict to the case b bigger than a third, just for simplicity. I mean, our results extend everywhere, but that's for simplicity. So this is the, you know, these are the, this is for each b, you want to, if you have a staircase, then you're going to accumulate to the point on this curve. Um, so now we say that B is obstructed if there is an obstruction there. So the capacity function at that, at the accumulation value is bigger than the volume. And that means there can be no staircase because if it were, if there were a staircase, it's unobstructed. And then the other case is the unobstructed case. And so what are the basic questions? We want to understand what is the structure of the set of B that are blocked or obstructed. So that's one thing. And then we'd like to know which B have a staircase. So what's the structure of stair? And these two um, sets are disjoint. The block is open, obviously, because the obstructed is an open condition. And we know we have two rational points in stair. That's what we started off by knowing. And so here's our main theorem which we have more or less proved. I mean, yeah, not totally, but we're really on the way to it. So for one thing, block is an open dense subset. So almost all points are blocked. And at each, at the, each end of each connected component of block, there are staircases. So block consists of a union of open intervals and at the ends of each interval, there's staircases. And uh, you know the staircases are increasing at one end and decreasing at the other one just as appropriate. And the steps of the staircases, remember the staircase obstruction sort of look like that. And the steps of these are themselves blocking classes. They're given by blocking classes. Um, and in fact, each blocking class is a step in one ascending and one descending staircase. So we have this interconnecting, interweaving family of staircases, which Morgan will describe to you. Um, the other thing, so those are very general results. The other thing we can say is suppose we look at at the z values corresponding to blocks. So just for simplicity. So let's look at the z values corresponding to the blocked intervals, which where we um, restrict to the case of b bigger than a third, so that accumulation is a one-to-one -one function on that set. And so this is si sitting inside this interval. And then the so that so we've got some interval. I'll draw a picture of it. So suppose we look at the you know where we look a big, we look at between six and eight. And then we look at in between eight and 10 and 10 and 12 and so on. Then inside this interval, say in between six and eight, this interval, then um, 
there, there's a homeomorphism of the intersection of the, this set with the set of Z, Z block, block points with the complement of the middle third cantor set. In other words, the, the structure of this set is, is a, it's a sort of fractally organized set. It's not a simple, we've got a countable number of intervals, but they're in block, but they're arranged in a very in, interesting way. So in between six and eight, you have this, the complement, what you remove to get the middle third counter set. And similarly in each of these other ones. So we have infinitely many copies of that, just sort of translated. And then the rest of, the, of what's happening, the rest of block is described by symmetries. There's one shift and one reflection, which are really quite complicated. So I don't want to go into the details of them. But um, these symmetries come from properties of this Diophantine equation, and they descri describe the rest of the order structure of block. So, you know, you can, you can take the block and divide it into intervals like six, in between six and eight, and it will have this middle third cantor set structure. On the other hand, there's this overarching structure of symmetries that also, so it's really an interesting structure we found for this, the set of, of um, staircases. And as I say, we haven't quite proven this, but we nearly have. Um, now, and then we have a conjecture that we found all the staircases, right? So we've got these two irrational values, irrational values where we have a staircase, and then all the endpoints of the intervals in block uh, have staircases and nothing else, there are no other staircases, but we haven't really tried to prove that. I mean, that, that seems very hard. Um, but we do have a, a rather complicated argument showing that there's no staircase at a fifth. But that argument is so complicated, it doesn't seem possible really to reproduce it in any nice way to extend it. Um, anyway, so that's our main theorem. And so what I want to, I mean, does anybody have a question about it? Uh, actually, I was going to explain it a little bit more on this curve, just sort of what it looks like. So this is the, um, the, that accumulation curve. And so, you know, what does it look like here? Well, at centered at six and eight, we have what we call blocking classes. So we have blocked intervals. So one centered at six, and it goes from just a little less six to six to just a bit bigger than seven. So, you know, all this bit is blocked. And then there's another one centered at eight, which starts just above seven and a half. And, um, no, just a, about, above seven and a quarter and goes up there. So all that's blocked. So almost all of this is blocked. And then centered at this point here, we have a, a blocked interval. And then in between each of these, we have a blocked interval. And then, well, you can see in between each of these, we have blocked intervals, but I can't draw it anymore. It just gets impossible. So it's, that's what's happened. Between any two of these things, we have blocked intervals. And if you want to look at the numerics of these things, so the, the first new point is at seven and a quarter, which we're very interested, the continued fraction expansions are very important. So remember, seven one quarter means seven plus one over four. And then there's another step at seven five two, which is seven plus one over five plus one over two. So that's 79 over, and that is this one. This is seven five two. Oh, sorry. This one is seven, four, and this one here will be the other one, seven, three, six. So we have these ones are sort of, they come in levels. So that, you know, the, with the, the six and eight ones are sort of level zero. Seven, four is level one. These two, I would say are level two. And then we have, you know, more level three, level four and so on. And they organize into staircases. So a staircase, you can take that one, that one, and then all of these, and they form a decreasing staircase, which it converges to the end point of that red blocked interval. It converts to decreasing staircase. So it means that this blocking class eight can be considered as a step in a staircase, which is converging to the lower blocking class. And then if you want the ascending staircase, which goes to eight, then you start with um, this one, the six class, and then you, you put in the seven, four class, and then you put in that class, and then you extend that here 
with all these continued fractions to the, the ascending staircase. And you notice these continued fractions are really nice. We have these repeated uh, five ones here and we have repeated seven threes here. So they're sort of we call two periodic staircases because of two, the period two repeating. So this is actually, this was just, well, these staircases were discovered in our first paper, but the further structure was discovered in later papers. So Morgan's going to say more about this. But that's a sort of basic what it looks like to give you an, a big beginning taste. Now, what are the basic technical underpinnings? Well, um, the first thing is that really underlies that we can actually do these calculations at all is the fact that if you have an ellipsoid, you can cut it up into balls in such a way that embedding the ellipsoid is equivalent to embedding balls, the balls. And then the point is when you embed a ball, that's equivalent to embedding a ball in CP2 means that you, you remove the ball and you blow up and you get a form on the, on the blow up, which whose size, where the size of that exception divisor is the size of the ball you embedded. And therefore what that means is that it says this, if you have an irrational ellipsoid, so P over Q is rational, there's a weight decomposition, which I will say a little bit more about. It's a sequence, a decreasing sequence of numbers, such that the ellipsoid embe embeds in a rescaling of our target, if and only if the disjoint union of the balls of sizes, these Ws, embeds in um, the, you know, this, ex this, ex um, enlargement of HB, which is, of course, a one point blow up of CP2, but with a form where um, you take the, the Poincare dual of the line class together with B times the Poincare dual of the first exceptional divisor, the one you've blown up, times lambda. So you've rescaled. And if you can embed the balls in here, that's equivalent to saying that there's a symplectic form on this n plus one fold blow up, where the class is the same on the first two things, lambda of the line, lambda b on e zero, and then all the other ones have size of the size of the ball you've blown up. So you know if you so so for example, what's this weight decomposition? If you take the ellipsoid e one three, then this is three, and this is one, and you can divide it into three triangles like that. And each in each of these triangles, it's known that you can fully, fully fill it by a ball. So you can really cut up the ellipsoid into three balls. And the claim is that embedding the ellipsoid is the same as embedding those three balls. And, um, you know, this is one way of looking at that cutting up, but it's entirely equivalent to drawing a rectangle like that. And then, you know, this is size length three, and this is size length one, and chopping it up into rectangles. And that is much easier to see what you're doing. And that, if you know anything about continued fractions, is the way one can get the continued fraction decomposition. So, you know, if you take, for example, three over eight, so this is three and this is eight, three, three, and two, so that's three and eight. So then we can chop it up into one thing of size three, another thing of size three, another one of size two, and then these ones of size one. Okay, and that corresponds to a cutting up of the ellipsoid into two balls of size three, one of size two, and two of size one. And that gives you that eight over three is one, uh, sorry, it's, you've got two balls of size three, and then you've got one of size two, and you've got two balls of size one. So the and so that is two plus one over two plus one, sorry, one over one plus one over two. So, you know, these numbers here are the multiplicities of the weights. So there's all sorts of beautiful numerics associated to continued fractions. And, you know, Felix and I explored some of this when we were doing the balls thing. So that's one thing about the weight decomposition. So you can replace the ellipsoidal embedding problem by a, a problem of what, when do you have a particular, uh, uh, you know, which classes in the, in the you know, blow up of CP2 
are represented by symplectic forms. And that was something solved in the 90s, beginning of the 1000s, you use cyber Witten theory and various things. And the claim is that if you have a class alpha, which is lambda squared times one minus b squared, um, so alpha is equal to lambda times the, the line class minus lambda b times the first blow up minus the sum of m i e i and um, we first need the volume you know lambda squared to be positive that's a volume constraint and then we need it to be positive or actually strictly positive for all exceptional divisors because exceptional divisors are always represented by j holomorphic curves the, the gramoff invariant is one therefore they've got to have positive area and that's enough of a condition. So the takeaway from this is that exceptional divisors provide embedding instructions. And you can see them in through ECH, but you can see them this way. Okay. Now, when we're Lisa, looking at the, yeah? You're at 26 minutes past the hour. Okay, I'll try and be quick. So when we're at it, the blow up, so the exceptional divisors lie in classes of this form some multiple of the line class, well, the Poincaré dual, I'm not writing that, uh, a, a coefficient times the, the first blow up, and then M-I-E-I. And the sharpest obstructions, the, in other words, the ones that provide the outer corners of the staircase, come from what we call perfect classes, which are given by four numbers, D, M, P, Q, where D and M are those coefficients. And P and Q have, um, have a weight decomposition. This is the weights of P and Q, and you multiply by Q to make them integral. So they're the integral weight decomposition of that fraction. And that will be the center of the step, and they will give you an obstruction looking like that, where this is P over Q. Um, and you know, if you're given a tuple like this and you want to know, is there a class associated to it? Well, it's got to satisfy these diophantine, you know, first churn class is one, self-intersection minus one, those are just you know, numeric conditions, and then it has to be reduced correctly under Cremona moves. And in other words, it's sort of equivalent to saying it has to be represented by a sphere. And that is hard to check when your classes are different. You know, when, when, when your classes are very big, it's hard to know how it reduces. But, you know, if you just look at classes satisfying the first two conditions, they're called quasi-perfect classes. And they do give obstructions, but they're never optimal unless they're perfect. So you really need to know your classes are perfect if you want to calculate the abstraction function. Now, what have we proven? Well, we proved first of all, a very nice sort of hidden property of what our uh, perfect classes look like. That there's this quantity T, which means you see P and Q are sort of obvious, they're the steps. And then, you know, given P and Q, what are D and M? Well, D and M are given in terms of P and Q by means of this formula. So T is this particular number, with, and this is related to, again, that Diophantine equation. And then we have T, D being one eighth of three P plus Q plus epsilon T, where epsilon is either plus one or minus one, depending on whether this B is bigger or equal to bigger or less than a third, and similarly for M. So we found that structure. And then um, this structure, it turns out that when you look at the staircases that limit at the endpoints of a block B interval JE, the recursion parameter of that staircase is TE. So that T really has geometric meaning. It's the recursion parameter of our staircases. Morgan will say more. Then the other thing is that every quasi-perfect class with center bigger than the minimum it could be as a blocking class. So these quasi-perfect classes are blocking classes. And then here's a nice criterion for perfection because I told you that the Cremona condition is sort of impossible to verify, but all you need to know is that the lower endpoint of the corresponding obstructed B interval is unobstructed. So if you can construct a full filling at that point, then you know that you're, you have a perfect obstruction. And that's what you can do using almost toric vibrations. And that's what Nikki's going to explain to you, how to do that. And that's, you know, that sort of fits in better with our, um, um, fits in better with our way of looking at things. And then you can also show the upper end endpoint is unobstructed and there are staircases and stuff. Um, so that's what Nikki's going to do, how to show how to construct these necessary fulfillings in order to get um, perfection. 
And, but Morgan is going to talk about, you know, it's going to talk more about the structure of the staircases blocking classes. So I think that's all I wanted to say, just to tell you what's going on. So I think I've finished on time. Thank you. But, you know, perhaps if anybody's got a quick question, I could um, try and answer it. If not, I will stop sh sharing and pass over to somebody else. I think it's Morgan's on now. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Let's see. Great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks, Dusa. So just and thanks um, also for um, for being able to speak here. So um, yeah, so just to reiterate what Dusa said just on the previous um, page. So uh, for the this part of the talk, we're really going to be sort of confusing the distinction between the center of a quasi-perfect class um, and the quasi-perfect class itself. So that tuple DMPQ and the obstruction with the breakpoint at the center. So, um, so right, so we have these staircases that sort of look like this and this point, the uh, Z value, the horizontal value of this point um, is at some point, rational point P over Q. And um, when that happens, this whole step sort of is, is um, created by the fact that this symplectic form Deuce was talking about has to be positive on this um, symplectically embedded sphere. So, um, so when we're talking about a class DMPQ, we essentially only need to know the center or the breakpoint of the step, um, because by these formulas that Dusa gave us, we can figure out what T, D, and M are. And um, in this part of the talk, we're only going to be focusing on uh, epsilon equals one. So we have this plus here, and that's because um, right now we're just going to be talking about the interval between uh, z equals six and z equals eight. So staircases that accumulate between six and eight. Um, and as Dusa said, we have symmetries and other sort of um, operations that allow us to understand the rest of the staircases use, using only what we know about the staircases between six and eight. So here's an example of a perfect class. Um, D is three, M is two, P is six, Q is one and T is three and it has center six. And we'll also refer to that as the obstruction or the step um, with the breakpoint six. So I wanted, so this part of the talk is essentially an extended example of how to obtain that complement of the Cantor set structure between six and eight. So first we wanna start just by describing um, how, so the, the procedure that we, um, we like to call the fusion of two staircases. So first we need to describe the two staircases that we're fusing. So um, the first staircase is the upper staircase of E6. So what this means is it is, th this is one of the staircases that we um, proved in the first paper with the large group um, exists. And it is a descending infinite staircase. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, and it has steps centered at seven and then some repeating number of five ones, four, or at seven, some repeating number of five ones, five two. So that means these are the continued fractions of the breakpoints of the steps or the continued fractions of P over Q equivalently. And when we say it's the upper staircase of a certain class, that means that it accumulates to the um, upper endpoint of the interval blocked by the class six. So I six, this is just apply the accumulation point function to J six and J six is all the points where um, the obstruction from, so in particular, CHB is greater than um, CHB at the accumulation point of B is greater than the volume obstruction, um, the B volume obstruction at the accumulation point of B. As So I, I'm just reiterating what, um, what Dusa was describing. So this is the interval where um, the class centered at six um, meet, rules out the existence of an infinite staircase. So at the upper endpoint, of the interval where that's possible, we actually do have an infinite staircase. It has these steps. Um, and in the picture, I've just organized them from left to right 
by the z values of the blocked interval or equivalently just by the z values. So if you take the actual um, decimals of all these continued fractions, you're going to see that six is the lowest and then seven, five, one, four. So remember this is equal to seven plus one over five plus one over one plus one over four is going to be less than seven, five, two is going to be less than seven, four. So um, if I order the classes in this way, uh, what I get is I see all the staircase classes and this graphic indicates that they are, um, their centers are descending and they accumulate to this upper endpoint of the interval blocked by six. Okay. And we also have um, a staircase uh, which ascends to the lower endpoint of the interval blocked by eight. And it has steps with a repeating seven, three part. So the first step is six. The next step is seven, four, then seven, three, six, seven, three, seven, four. The next step will be um, seven, three, seven, three, six. And those ascend. Um, so the thing to notice, the reason why I, I made this graphic um, in this way is that there's a shared step in these staircases. It's the one centered at seven, four, so seven and a quarter. Um, and I highlighted in green sort of where that shows up. So uh, to look at a picture, in this picture, we have two figures. And in both figures, we're looking at the obstructions from the same classes, um, but different B values. So on the left, we have this accumulation point inverse of um, 7, 5, 1, 5, 1. So this is um, the supremum of the interval blocked by 6. And on the right, we have the infimum of the interval blocked by eight. So these are the this is the these are the two staircases, two of the staircases we found in the um, original paper. And one of them, so this uh, this on the left, we're sort of looking at the staircase, the first staircase they talked about on the right, we're looking at the second one. So in red, in both figures, I put the obstruction from the class centered at six. In cyan, I have the obstruction from the class centered at um, eight. And in green, I have the obstruction from the class centered at seven, four. And on the left, you can see um, this blue, this is an infinite staircase. You know, I, the resolution isn't high enough for you to really believe me maybe that it's actually an infinite staircase, but this is what it looks like in that picture. But on the right, you can see it sort of just degenerates into nothingness. Um, it's, it's not gonna be uh, infinite. And the accumulation point, so if I were to look at um, the, the uh, accumulation point curve that Duso was um, describing, it would go right through here and it would go right through here. So I do actually have infinite staircases um, in both of these cases. On the right, um, my infinite staircase is given by these pink um, curves and it really degenerates. Um, you can barely see if you really zoom in, there's a little bit of a pink obstruction there, um, but these, this infinite staircase really dies away as you decrease B. Um, but the important thing is that you know, even as you change B, uh, this obstruction centered at seven four really persists. So in order to talk about um, how to fuse two staircases, we need to understand the recursive construction of a staircase. So we're going to say that a pre-staircase associated to a blocking class DM, PQ, T sub E is a sequence of quasi-perfect classes um, where each of the entries, so the D, M, P, Q, and, and T, all satisfy this recursion uh, here given by T sub E. So the Ds do, the Ms do, the Ps, the Qs, the Ts do. And also the centers limit to an endpoint of the interval blocked by E. So that's, that is what it means to be associated to a blocking glass. Um, so the ones that we've seen so far, the upper staircase is associated to six. We can recast it in this language. It has seed, um, uh, sorry, it has T three equal to three and um, the seeds eight and seven, four. So I can actually include eight in the staircase and the recursive pattern gives me you know, this staircase here that I've been talking about. And if I look at the lower staircase associated with six, same thing, I can view it as um, given by this recursion on t equal five and the first two steps, six and centered at six and seven, four. Um, so we call these pre-staircases because they could, there could be fake staircases. So if I just make all of these definitions, nothing is telling us that these classes um, are perfect, uh, which would mean that they would Cremona reduce properly, i.e. be uh, represented by symplectically embedded spheres. So here's an example. We don't really need to go into this that much, but the point of this example is that 
I have um, a pre staircase and it goes, you know, it accumulates to the proper accumulation point. This red curve again is that accumulation point curve, um, but it's not, it doesn't realize the actual, um, the actual embedding function, which is here. So, uh, so everything looks good, except the fact that these staircases aren't perfect. And the other thing is they're associated to this pseudo class. So this class that has D and M um, not integral. So there are a couple of things wrong with it, um, but just because something's a pre-staircase doesn't tell us that it actually equals the, um, the embedding function. So that's what Nikki is going to be talking about is how we can certify that that's true. Okay, so finally we come to describing how to get the two new staircases associated to the class seven four from the old ones associated to six and eight. So what we're doing is we're going to consider this recursion again, X kappa plus one equals T E X kappa minus X kappa minus one. Um, and I'm gonna set T E to be T of seven four, which is 13 and consider um, the first seed to be six and the second seed to be seven five centered at seven five two or to have continued fraction seven five two. So what that gives me, um, it makes more sense if I look at the picture of all of the classes organized together. So um, here, these are the ones that I had shown you before. And I've added um, this red one here. And if I, and that's because this is gonna be the third class that I obtain when I apply the recursion uh, using these two seeds um, and T is 13, I'm gonna get seven, five, three, one, six as P over Q. So this is gonna be uh, P two over Q two. And I'm gonna to continue to get um, more and more, um, more and more P, o, P over Q values and they will accumulate to the lower endpoint of the interval blocked by seven, four. And the, one of the more interesting things that happens also is that there the um, continued fractions of these p cap over q kappas have a repeated part? So they also repeat um, some digits. In this case, seven five three one. And I can do the same thing on the other side. So set t equal to thirteen and um, use eight and seven three six as my first two steps, and I'm going to end up getting um, a staircase which accumulates to the upper endpoint of the interval blocked by seven four. And it again has repeating the steps, the continued fractions of the, the steps have um, repeating parts. Okay, so the last part of the section of the talk, I just want to give you the actual definition of a generating triple and um, how this pattern propagates into the Cantor set complement. Um, so a generating triple is a triple E left, E middle, E right um, of, three quasi-perfect classes. Um, e right and E middle are seeds of a descending pre-staircase associated to E left. And E left and E middle are seeds of an ascending pre-staircase associated to E right. So essentially you should really just be thinking about this example. Um, and then these two conditions are numerical conditions that are essentially just don't worry about them too much, but they're necessary to prove this proposition, which says that generating triples propagate themselves. Um, so I won't, so I'm, I'm going to show you this um, proposition again on the next slide. So I'll just go to the next slide. Um, so what this is saying is, so, okay. So the, the first um, pre-staircase was saying that, or sorry, the, the, the first condition in being a generating triple was saying that I have um, a staircase like this. And this was the first staircase I was considering the one associated to six. And so what the proposition tells me is, okay, I'm gonna take the third step in this pre-staircase and I get a new generating triple, six, um, seven, six, seven, five, two, and seven, four. And so that's what I showed on the next slide. I'll get a new generating triple. And then I can just continue to do, you know, the same, just the exact same pr procedure, um, treating the triple six, seven, five, two, seven, four as, um, exactly as I did six, seven, four, eight. So that means I'm gonna have um, some new ascending staircase sort of ascending to seven, five, two, and then another descending one here. And I could have done this um, for this triple as well. And similarly, um, if I take the um, sort of rightward leaning pre-staircase, I again get another uh, generating triple. So I highlighted one here, and this is also a generating triple. 
So the point is that this pattern continues infinitely. Um, and if I consider all of the blocked intervals, I'm going to end up getting what you remove to get um, something homeomorphic to what you remove to get the Cantor set. Um, one interesting fact that we've observed but don't know how to prove is that the period periodic parts of the steps of the staircases combine when I um, get these new staircases. So uh, the, I think the important thing here to look at is the example. So in this generating triple we've been talking about, the staircase associated to six has repeated parts. The steps have repeated part five, one. The staircase associated to eight, the steps have repeated part seven, three. And then for both of the staircases associated to seven, four, the repeated parts are a combination of five, one and um, seven, three. So this is a, a fact that seems to be true um, in general, but we don't know how to prove it. And finally, I just wanted to um, sort of show a graphic that kind of gets again at this um, middle third Cantor set uh, complement idea. So at the top, I have sort of a slightly different version, a straightened out version of what Dusa was drawing on the accumulation point curve, the actual intervals blocked by these different classes with the, all their different centers. And on the bottom, I've just represented each of those blocked intervals by a vertical line. And I've attached to each of those vertical lines the periodicity of the staircases associated to that um, blocking class. And then the helpful thing about this graphic is that each of these Vs um, gives you a generating triple. So here's a V that's a generating triple, um, and here's another one. And I, I so in this graphic, I can't you know skip, right? So this is not a generating triple because it skips over that eight, but, um, but here is another generating triple. So you can see the pattern gets more and more complicated. Um, so I will hand it over now to Nikki. Thank you. Sweet. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the proof methods, in particular, how we use um, ATFs to construct embeddings to show that all of our staircases are unobstructed at the accumulation point. So as Morgan said, we have all of these blocked intervals here on the number line. And what we want to do is we want to show that the left endpoint of these blocked intervals, the B value that has that accumulation point does have a staircase. And so for the ATFs, what we want to do is if the accumulation of B is the left endpoint of one of these blocked intervals, then we want to show that that is unobstructed at the accumulation point. In other words, that the embedding function at that accumulation point is equal to the volume obstruction and we have a full filling at the accumulation point. Okay, so first I'm gonna give just a little background on um, what, how, how we do this. So we start with the, um, Delzant polygon for HB. Um, and then uh, this picture here corresponds to some integral system on HB with elliptic singularity. So the pre-image of a point in the interior is just a normal torus. But we can preserve the um, symplectomorphism type of HB, but look at some other integral system on HB. And then we can add various decorations to this diagram to represent a different system we're considering. So in this second diagram here, we've inserted three of these nodal rays. Those are these red rays here. And at the end of the rays, there's a, a marked point. And what that marked point represents is the pre-image of that point is a pinched torus rather than a normal torus. So um, it's a, a different integrable system we have on HB. And then once we've inserted these nodal rays, we can uh, perform mutations to uh, to the diagram. So from this second diagram to this third diagram, I've performed one mutation. And from this third diagram to the fourth diagram, I've performed a mutation. And so to illustrate how you do that, I'm going to show you from this third to the fourth diagram. So here we're performing a mutation at this nodal ray that's emanating from this vertex V. And so what we do is we extend the nodal ray down until it hits the side of the uh, the quadrilateral, and then the part with the origin, this quadrilateral, we're going to uh, keep constant. And then 
this triangle here, we're going to act on by an ASL2Z transformation that fixes um, the nodal ray emanating from V and aligns the edges um, emanating from V. So it's going to map, map this edge up here. And then the resulting diagram is this diagram here. And so we can see in doing that process, we've changed the affine lengths of the sides and have a new diagram. And why this is useful is that um, in performing these mutations, we can find new um, embeddings that we weren't able to see in the Delzant um, diagram. So this is a result from Christopher Gardner, Holm, Mandini, and Perez. And what they showed is that if we perform mutations to our base diagram, such that the origin is always fixed, and we get some resulting diagram where we see um, a triangle corresponding to some ellipsoid that even if we have a nodal ray in the interior of that triangle, we can still conclude that there's a, a scaling of the ellipsoid symplectically embeds into HB. And so because we have this embedding here, that gives us a upper bound for our embedding function. And uh, this is very useful because we're trying to show at the accumulation point, we have a embedding. So our goal is to use these ATFs to show that for these particular accumulation points, these Z infinities that are the left endpoints of the blocked interval, that the embedding function at that accumulation point equals the volume obstruction. So we have a full filling at the accumulation point. So to show this, we have a, um, a two-step process. So um, step one is for each of these accumulation points, we want to show that we can mutate the diagram in some way such that the affine length on the x-axis is equal to one over the volume at the accumulation point. And then after we've gotten to that diagram, then step two is going to be um, saying that if we continually mutate about y, so that um, extends down here, um, that the, the diagram will eventually limit to the uh, full filling at the accumulation point, which will correspond to, to this um, triangle here. That is the full filling we want. So um, what these look like in the graph of the, um, the embedding function is here in black, we have the embedding function. And in red is the uh, volume constraint. And then this Z infinity is the accumulation point. And then um, the value we want at the accumulation point is the volume obstruction. And so in step one, we get some embedding that is uh, a non-ideal embedding corresponding to somewhere around this orange dot. So it does not lie on the embedding function. It lies above it. And then in step two, once we continually mutate, um, we're moving just along this straight line. So we're not changing the output of the function, we're just increasing the Z value. And then the limit will uh, reach the um, accumulation point. So this is a bit different than what has been done previously where the ATFs instead were um, getting the inner corners of the graph. But for us, until we get to the limit where we're actually going to be above the embedding function. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about how, um, how we do this. So uh, as Morgan said, we're just focusing here for staircases whose accumulation points are in between six and eight. And for those accumulation points, we have this base diagram here. And this base diagram is the one that we previously saw, which is just performing two mutations of V. And why this is the base diagram is um, the, the length here from um, the origin to X is 2B minus one. And 2B minus one is one over the volume of the accumulation point for the staircase corresponding to the um, interval blocked by eight, which is one of the ones in the top layer that Morgan was pointing out. And so once we're at this diagram, we no longer have to mutate about V and we'll only mutate about Y and about X. So what do these mutations do? Well, when we mutate about Y, Y is gonna extend down 
and it's always going to hit this side of the quadrilateral. And so doing such a thing, the length of um, OY is going to increase because this side length here is going to come up here. So um, the length of OY will increase while the length of OX remains constant because um, that's in the part of the quadrilateral that's staying constant. And so such a mutation will correspond to the Z coordinate of the embedding increasing. And similarly, when we mutate about X, X is going to hit the top of the diagram. And so this is going to increase the length of OX while the um, length of OY is going to remain constant. And because the length of OX is, we're thinking of as one over the volume of the accumulation point, um, this increasing will correspond to the Z coordinate of the embedding decreasing. So we have these two mutations we can do, or one of them increases the Z coordinate and another one decreases the Z coordinate of the embedding. And to see why these are useful, we can look at this uh, diagram that Morgan made here and showed you. So our, our base triple um, has this six, this eight, and this um, one whose accumulation point is seven, four. And so um, to do the, so on this diagram, I'm going to illustrate the, the step one part. So the step one part is where we want the bottom um, length of the quadrilateral to be one over the volume of the accumulation point. And I'm gonna show how we can go from one of those to the other when we move down the tree of this picture. So at, at, um, for this four one, we're going to um, first mutate about Y, and then we always finish with a mutation about X. And then if we um, move down the tree to the left, to the six here, well, moving to the left corresponds to um, decreasing the Z coordinate because this is like a number line. So we're always going to keep the X at the end, but then we're gonna add an extra X because we want to decrease the accumulation point and that's what X does. But if we move to the right from four to this six, we're increasing the Z coordinate. So instead we want to mutate about Y. So we're always gonna keep an X at the end, but we're gonna add an extra Y. And then um, similarly, if we're going from six to eight, we're increasing, so we're going to add a Y. And then from six to 10, we're decreasing. So that's gonna be an X. So uh, what the main thing we're trying to prove is that if we um, do these various sequences of mutations from one to the next, they will always um, produce the diagram such that that bottom length is one over the volume at the accumulation point and that they all, um, work nicely in, in this um, fashion. And then once we get to that base diagram, we can um, well argue that we can just mutate about Y for the rest of the time and the diagram will eventually limit to the fulfilling at the accumulation point. And then um, once we have that, at, as uh, Dusa said, for all of these left, um, the left endpoint of all of these intervals, we can conclude that all of these classes are perfect, which is what we need to, um, which is what we need. And that is all. Great, well, uh, let's thank the speakers for their great talks. Are there any questions for uh, Dusa, Morgan, or Nikki? Um, I had a, ooh, sorry. I had a question just to orient myself. Um, can you go back to the picture Morgan made with the blocking classes? Yeah, I, I can pull, oh. Either, either. Oh, sure, yeah. Nikki, if you have it um, ready, that's probably. Um, yes. Well, I, in a way, we don't even need the. I don't even need the picture, but I just like the picture. 
Um, it's a very nice picture. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. So th this is just a basic question to orient myself. So what are those blocking classes? Where do they come from? D did I understand correctly that they're supposed to come from a different staircase? Like I'm trying to understand the picture for how your various staircases fit together. Um, maybe, maybe I should share my screen, sorry, and then I can draw on it, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so se several of the classes come from um, staircases we know about. And then once you fuse two staircases, you get a bunch of new classes. So basically, um, it might be easier. Well, so if I were to give you, tell you what these classes are. So this is six, the one centered at six. This one's the one centered at eight. Um, this is the one centered at seven, four. Uh, here is one, I don't know why I have all these different colors, but this is seven, five, two. And here's seven, um, three, six. And then this one, I'll just do this one here, seven, um, five, one, four. So every um, line, every gray line that you go down is an infinite staircase. So that's an infinite staircase. That's the infinite staircase associated to six, the upper one. And similarly, this one's the infinite staircase associated to eight. So this is the like the repeating seven, three staircase. And here's the repeating um, seven, five, one staircase. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I fuse these two, so basically I start off with this X and then once I fuse these two staircases, um, I can consider the recursion with the recursion parameter T um, seven, four, which is 13 and start with this and this. And then I can draw this line um, and then I end up getting all of these steps, which um, this purple staircase is the repeating seven, five, three, one staircase. Mm -hmm. And then I can do the same thing over here with, um, I'll use orange or something, these two as the starting steps. And I end up getting everything on this line. And those accumulate to the upper end point of the interval block by seven, four. And so then now I have another, I have two more crosses and I can do the same thing. So basically I can treat um, this cross here just as if it were the original cross. And so I end up getting, um, you know, now I get these two staircases and same thing um, over here. This is why the, the, this is the whole sort of generating triples propagating thing. So now I have a cross there and I end up with two new staircases like that. So that, that's how this, I mean, I stole this pattern from Alan Hatcher's um, number theory via topology or something book of a fairy diagram. Um, mm -hmm. This is one way to draw a fairy diagram. Mm -hmm. I see. But so if I understood correctly, you have some operations for generating new staircases from old staircases. Um, yeah. Uh, do, can you, do, is, is, is it correct that the germ of these staircases is the one at one third? Like, can you generate all the other staircases that you found off of the one at one third by some kind of fusions and, and reflections and things like that? Or, or, or did you, did, did, it, 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 are there things that aren't, you know, sort of visible at the one at, at B equals one third? I think that's Dusa and Nikki's. Yeah, can I answer that question? Sure. Because we wrote about that in our paper um, with Nikki. So the staircase at one third is very different because it's got a, a, a triple, it's got three strands. And it doesn't consist of blocking classes because um, all the, you know, all the B's or the N's over D's are sort of the B values are less than the minimum of the accumulation function. So they, it, the P's and Q's are too small. They're less than the minimum of the accumulation function. So they're not blocking classes. They're perfect classes, but they're not blocking classes. Mm -hmm. So that, and, and there are three kinds of, of, there are three strands there. And so what we realized is if you, if you take two of the strands, I mean, they're, they're, and they're sort of generated by the pure recursion, which comes from um, Z goes to um, 6E minus 1. 
so that's just, you know, they all have that recursion. So each of these strands has a single seed in a way, because, and P over Q, each, for each of these strands, the, the ratios P and Q are part of, instead of each of them separately having a recursion, they're actually part of the same recursion. So you have P1 over P0, then you have P2 over P1, then P3 over P2, and so on. So they really have a different structure. On the other hand, you can take two of the strands and they turn out to be what numerically the same as what we call our basic blocking classes, which are the ones which are centered at six and eight and 10 and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, but they just happen to be centered at two and four. So they're too small to be part, you know, they're too small to be seen in that way, but just extend that and you get these, these beads. Mm -hmm. And then the third strand is very different. And the third strand actually acts as seeds for our staircases. So, in the paper Nikki and I wrote, we we didn't have we didn't talk about this, you know this, in this more finer network of things we're talking about here. We talked about the structure of what we call the staircase family SU, which had these blocking classes centered at, at six and eight and ten and so on, plus the associated ascending and descending staircases. And those ascending and descending staircases have seeds, and there's a, a unique lower seed and a unique upper seed. And those, the numerics of those seeds corresponds to the third strand in our one third staircase. So in some rather subtle way, you can say that that one third staircase generates everything, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. not in what I would think of as an obvious way. <laughs> and um, it, it, I mean, it also explains a little bit why you have um, you know, something from six to eight and then a translate from, I mean, I don't quite know what's going on. You have it from six to eight, eight to 10, 10 to 12. You just have this translation effect, which corresponds, we just have this family of classes, which you can parameterize by N. And I don't quite know what that's doing. Mm -hmm. um, but then the symmetries we've found, which are the basic symmetry, you know, Z goes to six E minus one, that, um, those extend to all our staircases and means that all the structure we found from six and above, it, tra it, it translates downwards. So we get, you know, other copies of th this. And then there's also a reflection. So that's sort of what happens for the B bigger than a third. And then there is a reflection which takes you somehow from B bigger than a third to B less than a third. So that um, the, the Fibonacci staircase is a slightly special staircase of a uh, case of the um, descending staircase. It's a reflection of the descending staircase that's associated to the blocking class at six. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's slightly disturbed because um, six is very small number. But so the p whole structure is sort of complicated, but I would say my, from my way, one way of saying it is that the, the staircase at a third generates everything. And that the you know the Fibonacci staircase has the same structure as all these other staircases we're finding. It's a sort of twofold staircase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. Is there any sense in which the 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 staircase for the ellipsoid into a cube generates all of Mike Usher's staircases? Or well, the thing is that that's I'm sure there is um, now. We haven't looked at that. Nikki had some very interesting things about the relation between going from a one-fold blow-up, looking through two-fold blow-ups to the, to the, um, to what Usher did, and I'm sure there's lots you could say about that. But you know, I, I sort of believe in getting into the, getting into one problem and completing it. And this right. problem, it's it's complicated enough to deal <laughs> with, finish all the proofs and. I mean, you know, what Nikki's trying to do, these ATFs, the formulas are nightmares, but, you know, she, she's using Mathematica and it's a great help. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you just try and do it by yourself, it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because it's quite intricate and, and the formulas are they're not obvious, put it that way. But I think we've really discovered a nice structure. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so I think it's worthwhile to actually prove everything, get it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's going to generalize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. And you know, like, you'll see. I, I think the one-fold blow-up is the easiest case. A polydisc is somehow like a two-fold blow-up. It's a sort of degenerate kind of two-fold blow-up. That's sure. a bit more complicated. Sure. Why? Why do you think you found all the staircases in the one-fold? Well, well, 
the thing is we find all the blocking classes because we've got this open dense set mm -hmm. and i think we find all the perfect classes i'm just finishing a proof which this morning seemed to work that every blocking class every perfect class um has to you can't have you every perfect class blocks uh, an interval and those intervals uh, j intervals cannot be nested so you can't have two blocking classes e and e prime where the interval blocked by e is included in the interval blocked by e prime mm -hmm. and so that means that we find all the perfect classes so mm -hmm. i hope that that will be a real theorem that one can state with confidence um and therefore, if there is another staircase, which there could be, because there definitely are obstructions which are not perfect, they would have to be of a different nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't know how to go about showing that they, these staircases don't exist. Now, Anna Rita Pires used some of the methods you used. She adapted some of your methods counting lattice points of triangles to prove that there's no staircase at a sixth. But it seemed to me that that was a nightmare of an argument. I mean, you know, there were 24. Yeah, well, you need to, yeah, right. you need to compute an Earhart function by hand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, I mean, I had, well, I was going to ask you about that. Right. Because so, so that one is unobstructed, but there's still no staircase, right? But, yeah. It's unobstructed and there's no staircase. But is that I, the only one you've ever seen that's unobstructed and doesn't have a. Well, there are lots of unobstructed ones um, because, you know, it's only the elements of block that are obstructed. All the other, all the other, you know, there's a whole cantor set of un, right, right, unobstructed points. But right. we're saying we think there's only a countable number of staircase staircases. Right, right, right. I see. I, see. I mean, you've got the rational ones that you could conjecture that there are no staircases at the rational ones except zero and a third. Right. But then right. there's all the irrational ones. Right, right, right. And, you know, I don't know, I just haven't thought how to get the handle of that. I mean, as I say, it's bad enough doing what we're doing. So let's get that really squared away right. and done. And then I don't think, you know, it, it's very feasible, but, you know, it may be something like you can use ATFs or something to show there are no staircases, but I don't know. Can, can you use ATFs to construct the, to construct, I mean, you were, it, it, to, to construct the actual embeddings for the staircase or just well you don't need to construct embeddings for the staircase yeah now, tara holm has been trying i mean there have been people emily moore tara have been trying to use atfs to get a handle on this problem and they haven't made much progress um the progress that was made is that i mean it really is the efficient way of proving that these these points are unobstructed because i mean one of the beautiful things is that the the mutations you've got this tetrahedron there are this this quadrilateral there are two mutations and they correspond precisely to um the two you know the two derived triangles so they fit in incredibly well with this notion of generating triangles having two associated generating triangles in in the two in the twofold blow up case, I have like used ATFs for irrational numbers to construct the whole um, like to get the inner corners, and I think like we're not going to do it because it's too complicated. But I think we could use a similar process to like you do it in a different way where you don't get an inner corner at each sequence, but you like go along the volume curve and then you course correct and then you can get to an inner corner. And so I think we could do that here if we wanted to, but it's um, unnecessary and a lot more calculations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's very cool. Are there uh, any more questions, maybe a quick a quick final question from the audience before we finish the recording. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Dusa Morgan and Nikki again. Thanks so much. <laughs>